Hey everybody, welcome back to Race of History. Today we are going to get into a video by Kings and Generals on the Battle of Kadesh. Uh, this is Ramses II versus the Hittites, I believe. And um, before I go into the video, I was going to say I'm going to be out of town the next couple of days. I'm going to, well, I'm going to see family in San Antonio. But while I'm there, I'm going to be doing a video. I haven't decided exactly how I'm going to put it together yet. I've kind of been brainstorming ideas. But I'm doing a walkthrough at the Alamo. Um, I'm doing this sort of tour thing. And uh, I'm, so I'm going to put out a video on the Battle of the Alamo while I'm there at the Alamo. So that'll be out. Uh, over the next couple of days, I'm not sure exactly when on the trip I'm going yet. Um, I can't remember when I have the, the tour scheduled for, but that'll be coming out. I'll try to get a couple of videos while I'm out of town, um, but there may be a day here or there that, that there isn't a video out. Um, I'll be gone four or five days, something like that. But the big thing is the Alamo video. That's something that I really want to do a, a first-person uh, view of, right? To be able to show kind of what this all looks like in context and all of that. The Alamo obviously is a big deal for the history of Texas. And, um, you know, even today is one of the things that even people that don't know any history from Texas know about the the story of the Alamo so that'll be coming out in the next handful uh, of days but with all that being said let's get into it kings and generals Kadesh 1274 BC the Mediterranean Bronze Age is undeniably one of the most interesting periods in all of human history the era owes part of its allure to a vague similarity to our own time. From the Mycenaean and Minoan Greeks in the west, to the ancient Mesopotamian kingdoms of Babylon and Assyria in the east, the Bronze Age saw the development of a complex multipolar system of highly organized states. Although rivals for influence and power, these kingdoms also depended on one another for the crucial trade resources needed to keep civilization going. Two of the heavyweight monarchies during the later Bronze Age were Egypt's New Kingdom and the Hittite Empire. As the 13th century BC began, these two military powerhouses fought for hegemony over the rich lands of Syria. This clash of titans eventually culminated in the first battle in all history to be recorded in detail, the Battle of Kadesh. Syria during the late Bronze Age served as the overflowing entrepot of the interconnected ancient Near Eastern world. Trading vessels from across the Aegean docked at thriving port cities such as Ugarit, swelling their markets with wares, including ivory, textiles, food, timber, as well as two components of bronze itself, tin and copper. Land trade routes snaked throughout the Middle East and distributed these wares, returning with exotic eastern materials such as the mystical lapis lazuli. Complementing a flourishing commerce, the region was itself blessed with a great agricultural fertility and wealth of natural resources. This bounty, together with Syria's vast array of squabbling city-states and small kingdoms, rendered the region vulnerable to surrounding powers. In the 15th century BC, the two major predators fighting for control over the resources of Syria were Egypt's militaristic New Kingdom and the Kingdom of Mitanni. Having only recently cast off the yoke of the Asiatic Hyksos, Egypt's new rulers sought to create a strategic buffer of vassals to prevent such an occupation from happening again. Yeah, we talked about this in the last Egypt video, but that makes sense, right? You're, you're trying to essentially take over an area that not only has given you problems in the past, but because you have some pretty major regional powers to the north of you there, you you, you want a, a buffer area to be able to kind of keep them all at bay, right? Which, I mean, that makes total sense. As we know, there are some really 
dominant powers that come out of that region throughout time um, and even around this time. And so it would make sense for Egypt to want a buffer there, not only to protect from those other powers, but also because that area has given them trouble in the past. After generations of internecine warfare, Mitanni, under threat from a dynamic new force in Anatolia and this new Egyptian empire, finally concluded a lasting peace in around 1420 BC. Okay, so a daughter was given in the peace deal. This is common for the time period, right? Somebody, a royal is married off and, and it's, you know, that blood packs, things of that nature are common in these peace agreements or settlements and, and all that stuff. This era of tranquility and brotherhood between great powers marks the apex of the Late Bronze Age, especially for the Pharaonic Empire. Vast tribute from Egypt's Canaanite vassal states poured into Memphis's coffers and flooded the kingdom in gold, while trade routes functioned unimpeded by warfare. Such prosperity, however, was not to last. A few generations after the Concordat, in roughly 1344, the growing threat on Mitanni's northwestern frontier finally made its move. Led by the warlike usurper king Supiluliuma I, this budding Hittite empire burst forth from its rough Anatolian heartland astride great war chariots and launched two lightning wars of conquest against Mitanni. These conflicts culminate... That is what makes this region so dangerous, right? So if you're having a hard time kind of wrapping your brain around why Egypt would go take over Canaanite territory. This is why. It's because one one roll of the dice for a a good warlike leader for any of these powers and and this could happen. There could be a a dominant dominant force pop up, you know, out of nowhere basically and so you know if you've seen this happen before if you know that that history says it's likely to happen again then you want to take every precaution you can while you have the opportunity hit in the sack of the Mitanni capital and the kingdom's final destruction crucially the Hittites intruded in Syria as part of their attacks usurping the strategically vital city of Kadesh and pushing Egypt's control south. This external threat came at a particularly inopportune time for the dominion of the pharaohs. The contentious reign of the so-called heretic pharaoh, Akhenaten, followed by the weakness of his son, Tutankhamun, and the subsequent fall of the 18th dynasty, ensured Egypt was distracted at home for many years. All the while, the Hittites consolidated power in Syria and flipped the Nile realm's vassals to their allegiance. That status quo soon changed once more with the advent of yet another line of Nilotic monarchs. Seti I of the 19th dynasty personally led Egyptian armies into Asia for the first time in decades, asserting pharaonic imperial authority, recapturing the traitorous vassals of Kadesh and Amaru, and even defeating a Hittite force. Unfortunately for Seti, however, he proved unable to maintain tight control over territories so distant from the center of his authority, and eventually concluded peace. By the time of Seti's death in 1279 BC, both Amaru and Kadesh had once more fallen under the Hittite aegis. Seti was succeeded by his prodigious son, Ramses II. Egypt's new monarch first dealt with Sherdan pirates and nomads on his western frontier, before turning his attention to Canaan. Understanding the unsuitability of Thebes as a royal seat when conducting military expeditions in Asia, Ramses II built an entirely new capital on the eastern Nile Delta, which he ever so humbly renamed P. Ramses, the House of Ramses. <laughs> the new capital served as a clear statement that he fully intended to reassert the authority of the twin crown on Canaan. The sequence of events that triggered Egypt's direct intervention in Syria is obscure in our records. However, it is likely that Amaru, playing the dangerous game of vassal politics, again changed sides and swore allegiance to Egypt. In the fourth year of his reign, 12... Yeah, this is just... It's 
if you are one of the vassal or client states or not even really states, city states really, um, of the region, you're between a rock and a hard place here, right? Because both sides are going to be extremely annoyed at you going to or helping the other side. But you don't know who's going to win. And so you're really just kind trying to kind of vie for the best place you can, trying to kind of placate both sides and eventually pick the side that you think is going to win. But it's just a, it's a terrible situation for them. 75, Ramses II marched his army north to secure the subject state and make a bold statement of intent to the vile Hatti. The pharaoh returned to P. Ramses at the conclusion of the relatively quiet campaigning season, ready for a climactic conflict in the next year. The Hittites had been fighting internecine skirmishes in the north, east and west of their realm for years, and that had weakened their response. Matters, however, had calmed by the mid-1270s. So, in the winter of 1275, King Muwatali II levied warriors from across the territories he controlled and hired mercenaries, and in doing so, assembled the greatest army in the history of the Hittite Empire. In 1274, Muwatali and Ramses both led their armies into Syria, where they encountered one another near the city of Kadesh. Before we detail the fascinating clash of these late Bronze Age heavyweights, we must first detail the armies with which they went to battle. In contrast to the classical and medieval eras of history, in which infantry, cavalry and iron weapons were the norm in warfare, Bronze Age warfare was very different. It was marked by two standout features. Firstly, bronze itself, an alloy of tin and copper used to forge the tools, weapons and armour of the era. Secondly, horse-drawn chariots, the elite mounted force of the age. The ironic army of Ramses II utilized incredibly versatile chariots, whose deadliest attributes were speed and maneuverability. These vehicles appeared lightweight and even fragile at first glance, but were in reality reliable and robust. Much like the later forces of light cavalry horse archers employed by civilizations such as the Huns and Mongols, Egyptian chariots were similarly designed to turn wheel and loose reins of deadly arrows into the enemy ranks while avoiding a grueling melee. When we look at the raw numbers for any given battle, it's common to split the armies into different troop types, infantry and cavalry for example. However, this disguises the tactical flexibility of Ramses's chariot corps. Rather than serving in one large block, the aristocratic charioteers of the New Kingdom's Great Empire were instead divided among the infantry regiments to create a combined arms military force. Interesting. Overall, it is likely that the pharaoh mustered around 2,000 chariots, manned by 4,000 men, for the campaign of 1274 BC. While the dashing superstars of the age were these charioteers, the true workhorses of Egypt's well-oiled military remained its ever-reliable infantry formations. During Ramses's Kadesh campaign, the army's 16,000 foot troops, raised with the aid of Egypt's famously stringent bureaucracy, were arrayed in divisions raised locally and named after a local god. These were Amun, Ra, Ta and Set, each possessing 4,000 infantry and an accompanying 500 chariots. Having the chariots kind of dispersed within the ranks of the infantry is very interesting for the time period. Um, I'm curious to see how this works. I didn't, I didn't know that. That, that totally, totally caught me off guard. I had no, I obviously, I knew chariots were here and were a big part of it. That's obviously one of the huge parts of, uh, Egypt in the late bronze age. However, the idea that they are, I mean, some militaries didn't do that with with heavy equipment, all you know, up to World War II. Like, 
I guess it just depends on doctrine, but but I just I didn't know that they did that, and so I'm interested to see how this plays out. Critics, both ancient and modern, have criticized Ramses for dividing his army in such a way. But the value of being able to march without depleting the land of supplies and pursuing many tactical objectives simultaneously made it worth the risk. As for the infantry themselves, experienced professionals known as Menfit would form the front ranks, while raw recruits or Nefru made up the rear and reserves. Foreigners or mercenaries, including Canaanites, Libyans, Sherdans, and particularly Nubian archers, also served in the pharaoh's army. We know far less about Muwatali's army than we do about that of Ramses, but there are cogent details we can piece together. Most notable were the brutal Hittite chariots. In contrast to the vehicles of their Egyptian enemies, these vehicles were far heavier, clearly built for weight and power yeah. on the charge. With a centrally balanced axle and a three-man crew wielding large thrusting spears, Hittite chariots focused on smashing into masses of enemy infantry and breaking them apart by force. In addition to... And you see this with different different armies that use chariots. They're not the same weapon, really. Right? Like... The way that they're used in some armies versus the way that they're used by others make it seem like they literally are two totally different things. They aren't used in nearly the same way. Um, but there were, there were places that made these chariots super heavy and durable. They weren't very agile in comparison to the others. Um, but they were... They were there to go straight ahead into enemy lines. The heartland forces raised from Hatti itself, Muatali marched to war at the head of troops from 18 allied and vassal states. They included the previously mentioned city-state of Ugarit, Kajimish, subjugated Mitanni and Azawa, a land on the faraway Aegean coast of Asia Minor. This Hittite army seems to have slightly outnumbered its southern foe, counting around 15,000 infantry and 10,000 charioteers. Again, in contrast to Egypt, Muwatali's forces were indeed focused on the shock chariot assault as their primary tool for achieving victory. On the ninth day of the third month of 1274's summer season, sometime in late May, Pharaoh Ramses was encamped with his vanguard Amun division in hill country one day's march south of Kadesh. Half a day behind Ammon marched the Ra division, followed by Ta and Set, half a day each further south still. Shortly after daybreak, Ramses broke camp and marched north along the east bank of the Orontes, before fording the river near Ribla. This took several hours, and it was at this point that the army captured two Shesu Bedouin nomads and brought them into the pharaoh's august presence. According to Egyptian sources, when pressed for information, these seemingly innocuous cattle herders told Ramses that the fallen one of Hatti is in the land of Kalib, to the north of Tunip. For the Egyptians, this news was very welcome. They had apparently arrived at Kadesh first, and therefore had complete control over the battlefield, while the Hittites languished in fear days away. However, it is likely that these informants were in fact sent by the cunning Muatali to mislead the pharaoh. As unknown to him, the Hittites were in fact very close at hand. As yet unaware of his dire peril, Ramses pushed the Amun division onto Kadesh, where it constructed a camp equipped with a defensive perimeter and embankments with soldiers' shields placed around the top for additional protection. The very I'm curious what everybody thinks about the, the kind of Napoleonic way that Ramses is, is maneuvering his army where the the army is not in one big group moving together towards the battlefield they're split off into different groups and they're able to uh well there's a whole couple of different advantages of doing it that way however the big disadvantage is if you get caught without your entire army that's an issue Right, so I'm curious what everybody thinks about this. Is it 
Is it smart? Is it the best way to kind of get where he's going? Or is it just asking for a beatdown? The center of the camp contained a shrine to the god Amun and the pharaoh's royal pavilion. Scouts were dispatched to reconnoiter the surrounding land late in the day, and one of them swiftly returned with something curious. Two prisoners had been lurking suspiciously near the Egyptian encampment. Initially, these men refused to respond to the pharaoh's questions. However, after being given a sound beating, they gave up information that was both invaluable and terrifying in equal measure. Apparently in confusion, Ramses asked, what are you? Attempting to ascertain who had sent them. They admitted to being sent by Muwitali. Ramses' heart would have dropped. In truth, the Hittites were shrouded behind a nearby mound to the northeast at Old Kadesh, furnished with their infantry and their chariotry carrying their weapons of warfare and are more numerous than the sand of the riverbanks. To Ramses's credit, his reaction seems to have not been one of panic or over-hasty, but efficiency and eagerness to remedy his own mistake in a comprehensive manner. He also seems to have owned that mistake, as the Egyptian sources do not attempt to conceal it. Regardless, the pharaoh immediately sent senior officials south in order to hurry the other three divisions of Ra'ad Tar and Set to Kadesh at top speed. Another speculative messenger was also sent north to summon a fifth division of foreign troops who might have been able to help the Ne'arin. South of Ramses's camp, Ra crossed the Orontes and began trudging towards their lord's camp, about seven miles north, in haste. At the same time, by old Kadesh, Muwatali received reports that an Egyptian army of some size had closed in. He was, however, as of yet unsure where exactly the pharaoh was, or the true size of his enemy's forces. Based on what happened... <coughs> this could have been so bad immediately. I mean, seriously, Ramsey's lucked out that... That it didn't immediately go all the way south for him. Because he's there with a quarter of his army. He felt like... Imagine this, right? You're Ramses. You show up with a quarter of your army. You set up this camp. There is literally a huge enemy army right across this river, and you have no idea they are there. If they don't get word, if they don't beat those those prisoners and find out that they're there, he... Literally, he's just sitting there waiting to get ambushed. I mean, it's it, it was a very fortuitous situation that it didn't go bad immediately. It is assumed that the Hittite monarch sent a 500-strong chariot contingent south as a reconnaissance in force, instructed to gather as much information as possible. While the 5,000 troops of Ra made for Ramses's camp, Muwatali's substantial chariot scouting force skirted the hill on which Kadesh was built and then crossed the Orontes, emerging to the right of Ra's desperately exposed marching column. The heavy Hittite chariots improvised, and now, with little other option, launched a direct charge at the Egyptian reinforcement division. Utterly taken aback, the Egyptian chariots screening Ra's right flank were swept away. The unprotected infantry failed to assume formation and immediately broke apart. Rather than staying to destroy Ra, which, given a concerted Hittite attempt, almost certainly could have been done, the assaulting... But that is exactly what those types of chariots do best. I mean, that was a perfect situation for them. They are literally built to do that exact thing, right? I mean, you, you can break an army quickly in that way if if things work out that way right i mean that was just a perfect example of exactly how those chariots are meant to work chariots simply carved through the column and emerged from the other side egyptian warriors probably a greater portion of the untested nefru fled to all points of the compass but it's clear that the chariots and some menfit veterans made an orderly withdrawal in ramses's direction Thus ensued a race against time. 
swift Egyptian chariots seeking to warn their pharaoh of the danger versus lumbering Hittite vehicles on the attack. Fresh from their near destruction of the unfortunate Ra division just minutes earlier, the Hittites swept north in an arc and beelined directly at the western side of the pharaoh's camp. The camp itself, having received the withdrawing chariots and able to see the incoming dust cloud, was abuzz with panicked activity. Amun division soldiers and Ramses's guard armed themselves and rushed to the defense. The pharaoh's family members hurried to the other side of the camp. Then the Hittites struck, smashing straight through the shield wall and beginning a melee. Although more Egyptian soldiers panicked, ran or died where they stood, the obstructive tents, vast wealth stores and other camp distractions were slowing and disorienting the Hittite assault. Many chariots... Yeah, and okay, so this is an example of where they're not as useful, right? Because they're not as agile, when you're out on an open field and you can just go straight through that's that's where they do well they are not very good at maneuvering very quickly and so when there are obstacles in the way in a lot of ways it's like the pros and cons of um oh the greek phalanx right the greek phalanx can be incredibly strong and sturdy under the right conditions but under the wrong conditions it can be in a very precarious situation right and so it's, it's sort of the same thing here. It is, no doubt believing victory had been achieved, turned to looting and their momentum died. In turn, the Egyptian infantry turned about and advanced slowly, pulling Hittite chariot crews out of their now impotent vehicles and dispatching them with the famously arced Kopesh blade. Every advantage of a chariot charge was gone. Within the royal pavilion, and bedecked in a long coat of armor, Ramses II donned the Capresh war crown of the pharaohs and mounted the royal chariot, pulled by his own personal steeds, victory in Thebes and beloved of Amun. With a command to Mena, his own chariot driver, the pharaoh gathered whatever of the Amun and Ra chariotry remained and led it out of the camp by the eastern approach. With Ramses at their head, the Egyptians swept northwest and prepared to confront the Hittites, chariot for chariot. At their divine king's signal, the Egyptian chariots swooped down upon the numerically greater enemy throng at rapid speed, unleashing arrow volleys and wheeling about to do so again and again. All the while, the Hittites failed to react. As a ramp Yeah, because again, the Hittite chariots are not really made for this. This close quarter... Uh, really agile, quick-moving sort of fighting. It's not really what they do, right? The Egyptian chariots are made for this quick-movement, agile type of fighting. And so in this particular situation, they're just... They're made They're made better for this, right? It's, it's more what they're made for. Um, if it was just a chariot-on-chariot -chariot fight and they all had you know were in straight lines going at each other that's that's what the hittite chariots would do well but here where they're in close quarters and the egyptian chariots can kind of just maneuver in and out fire volleys get out of range come back in fire volleys like they're they're difficult to contend with and uh, like he said earlier the the steps tribes and other you know, horse archers use this same sort of warfare later on in history. Side source, known as the Bulletin, tells us, Then His Majesty entered into the host of the Hatti enemies, His Majesty being like Set the Great of strength, and like Sakmet at the moment of her raging, and His Majesty killed the entire host of the wretched Fallen One of Hatti. The disordered Hittite formation shattered just as the Ra division had, Hatti warriors fleeing desperately, just as Ramses pressed the counterattack with greater force. A greater portion of the Anatolian Empire's 500 chariots lay broken on the field, along with their riders, and Egyptian infantry followed up to finish the job with clinical brutality. Muwatali, observing this disaster from a vantage near Kadesh, was accompanied only by his elite charioteers and vassal rulers. But realizing he had to act now, 
The Hittite king formed them up and prepared to make his own attack. Muwatali had his vassals cross the Orontes and launch an attack against the eastern part of the now almost undefended Egyptian camp. Ramses and his chariots were elsewhere, and it seemed that the Hittites were about to flip the battle once more. However, at the moment of catastrophe and the possible capture of the pharaoh's family, the Ne'arin division arrived from the north like agents of the Egyptian gods themselves and engaged the newly arrived Hittite force. As a grateful Ramses was To the Hittites, it probably looked like that was a trap. Later have inscribed on his mortuary temple at Thebes, the Na'arin broke into the host of the wretched fallen one of Hatti as they were entering the camp of Pharaoh, and the servants of his majesty killed them. Muatali's chariot force also routed back across the Orontes, leaving behind many destroyed vehicles as they went. Ramses drew back into the ruin of his camp to rest. Later that day, the Ta division arrived from the south, together with a number of shamed Ra and Amun troops who had fled during the fighting. The next day, Ramses lined up those troops of Amun and Ra, whose bravery had been found wanting, on the plains outside Kadesh. The pharaoh had them all executed as punishment for their transgression, almost certainly in full view of Moatali. The psychological impact of this fearful display, and the extensive losses in men and morale among the Hittite king's chariot forces, led him to propose a truce to the Egyptians. Ramses, who had also taken substantial losses in the inconclusive battle, accepted. Pharaonic sources attempted to magnify Ramses's tactical triumphs during the Battle of Kadesh, but it cannot be said to be anything other than a strategic disaster for the new kingdom. Weakened as his army had been by the clash with the Hittites, the pharaoh was forced to withdraw back to Egypt. In his wake came Muwatali, who, tailing Ramses, occupied the province of Upe. Worse still, the perceived failure of Egypt's campaign sparked a great anti-Egyptian revolt throughout Canaan. Ramses II, later to be known... Yeah, this is what happens, right? If you're a great power that has vassal states that see weakness, a lot of times they're going to revolt, and they're going to revolt all at once, which makes it an even bigger problem. This didn't look like a truce to me. This looked like an Egyptian retreat, right? Why Why would the Hittites still be coming further and further down if the, the agreement was a, a truce? Known as Ramses the Great, fought a number of further campaigns in Canaan and Syria during the subsequent years of his reign with the aim of recovering territories lost in the post-Kadesh revolts. However, the crucial vassals of Kadesh and Amaru would remain in Hittite hands permanently. Sixteen years after the Battle of Kadesh, Ramses concluded the world's earliest surviving peace treaty with Muwatali's successor, Masili III. The two allied kingdoms remained at peace until the notorious Bronze Age collapse, when the entire civilization of the Near East came to a chaotic end. We'll talk more about the Bronze Age in our future videos. So make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button. Please. All right. So that was the Battle of Kadesh. Uh, Kings and Generals always does a great job with these videos. So if there's any other ones from them that you want to see specifically, put it down in the comments below so that I'll see it. Um, and I'll put it on the list. I, I like doing them. So don't be afraid to suggest anything. Um, but as always, like, comment, subscribe. Help me keep building the channel over here. I'll put the Discord link in the description box down below, and I'll see you all next time.